Well, hi, everybody. Wes McDonald here. And I want to thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tiger Tube. And if you can't see us and you're listening, that means you're listening to us on Tiger Paw Radio. And thanks for listening in. So super excited about my guest today. Uh, one of the areas uh, of the world that we talk about uh, quite frequently is recurring revenue. It's kind of the dream for everybody. And there are certain channels and verticals where that seems like it's not an option. And today, I'd like to welcome uh, Dan Farisi, and he is the editor-in-chief uh, for uh, Commercial Integrator Magazine and does a lot of work uh, with uh, folks that are moving to recurring models. And Dan, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, Wes, for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so, like I said, we, we do a lot of uh, stuff on recurring revenue. And, and when it comes to mind, like you think of uh, certain things that lend itself naturally uh, to recurring revenue, you know, something maybe that has to be, uh, you know, requires a lot of care and feeding, for example, right? So one of the channels that I serve, the office equipment channel, uh, you know, printers and copiers that require paper and toner, you know, they figured out a while ago that, hey, there's, there's, there's an opportunity here for, you know, an actual service contract every month to be able to uh, do the care and feeding and take care of the service and, you know, do all of these kind of things, right? Um, cybersecurity is another one, you know, where you have uh, virtual elements like software, you know, in place. Uh, I know, for example, that the software that I'll be doing the editing of this video on afterwards, you know, I pay uh, like a flat monthly, you know, subscription fee for it, right? So i uh, really curious, um, the commercial integrator business models typically, though, have been largely built on uh, project-based revenues, right? And, in our talks, you said that they're looking to move into recurring revenue models as well. And, and if you could maybe please describe how uh, you think that that can be done. And is there more than just service-based recurring revenue opportunities, right? Yeah. So let me just kind of situate myself in terms of kind of why commercial integrator focuses on this. And I think that will kind of illuminate a little bit why integrators on the commercial side are looking at moving into recurring revenue. So commercial integrator exists to help integrators run their businesses better. You know, there are other publications that focus more on case studies that focus on other aspects of the business. We really focus very, very heavily on helping integrators run their businesses better. So that's why we're focusing on this topic. When we did our state of the industry piece in January, interviewing Chuck Wilson and uh, Tom LeBlanc from NSCA, they were talking about something that all commercial integrators are very, very familiar with, which is shrinking hardware margins. And they were saying that, you know, NSCA's research, and I, I can't vouch for it personally, but obviously NSCA is very, very well connected when it comes to topics of this sort, is that if you're not making, you know, 23, 24, 25, 26% margin on a regular basis on your hardware, that's really what you need just to cover your overhead, the costs of doing business. Forget about being, you know, a wildly successful organization, but if you want to cover the cost of doing business, you need 23, 24, 25, 26. And when we did our survey, there are a whole lot of integrators that aren't making that, you know, that may be in the teens, they may be in the low 20s. So the question is, if you're trying to run your business better, how are you going to make your business sustainable? And the thing is, if you talk about services, if you talk about recurring revenue, if you talk about AV as a service in general, or AV as a subscription, the potential for profitability is much, much higher. You could be talking about maybe 50 points of margin on a service-oriented uh, kind of an approach, as opposed to a hardware or, or capital project-centric approach. So that's that's one of the reasons commercial integrator is so focused on this topic. And that's one of the reasons we really try to beat the drum, so to speak, on why it's important for integrators to pivot their businesses. Now, in, in terms of you know what you said, West, our industry has very, very much been centered on project-based revenues for a very, very long time. I've been in the industry for, for 18 years. And over those 18 years, I can't tell you how many hundreds of case studies I've covered, uh, you know, talking about maybe a, a multi-million million dollar or at least multi hundreds of thousands of dollars capital project. And it's not as though those are going away. They're, they're certainly not. But the idea is, can you make recurring revenue a very substantial piece of your pie? Can you get that to maybe 25% of your business? Where you, whether, again, whether it's selling a AV as a subscription, where rather than making it a capital expenditure, you're making it a subscription kind of a thing, almost treating the room or the, the integrated system as though it was Netflix or as though it was Apple Music music or something like that, where you're paying on a regular cadence for the use of the equipment rather than purchasing the equipment, or, you know, the whole host of different recurring revenue uh, or, or service opportunities, everything from break fix to staffing. Yeah, I'm really glad you talked um, 
you know, about the importance of uh, gross margin or, you know, profit levels uh, to be able to sustain the business, right? And, and many, many years ago in the Office Equipment Channel, um, we saw the same thing. That's why they moved into, you know, kind of these recurring models in the first place. They used to just sell printers and copiers and then sell the, you know, the toner and the consumables. But, you know, it, it got to the point where it was so competitive that once, once those um, gross margin levels uh, dip below 30%, Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that, that's hard. Like you said, that puts people out of business, right? So the, uh, the good news is for any uh, commercial integrators watching today, that when they shifted that model, it immediately uh, pushed their gross margins under the model for, you know, probably 20 years uh, to more like 40 to 60 points mm-hmm. of uh, gross margin, right? For the same things just under those services. So, well, that's great. Absolutely. Um, now, you, you mentioned as well, obviously, that taking something from a CapEx expense, uh, I'm a bit of a home theater uh, enthusiast. I don't know if you can see behind me uh, around those uh, two lights that are in the other room. Um, I've actually got ceiling mounted uh, Atmos speakers and I've got probably the largest, uh, you know, television <laughs> uh, on the market so far anyway, at an affordable price, close to 100 inches. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm an enthusiast. I get it. And I understand what it costs to, to do those things. And me personally, I would have actually really loved to have had some kind of um, subscription model, you know, to be able to, to use those things, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, I'm one of those people as well. When I, when I think of technology, it's less of an investment and uh, obviously much more of, of an expense, just something that you have to pay for, right? And that ability to upgrade down the road would, would thrill me to no, uh, to no end, right? To get to the end of my contract and then say, okay, are you ready to move on to the next thing? I would absolutely um, love that, right? And, sure. you know, so taking it from that operating expense to, or sorry, from a capital expense into more of an operating expense, I get it. Maybe you can share a little bit about uh, why customers, you know, like uh, that, are, that are doing more professional, um, you know, either pro AV or commercial integration, why they would prefer it. Yeah, I think that there are a couple of different things to, to keep in mind there. Well, when you think about you know a, a capital expense, a project-based uh, operation, and you think about more traditionally where it's like you know one contract, one multi-million-dollar project, and then the integrator is on to do their next project. Um, that that's great, and there's nothing wrong with that, but. I I think a lot of customers would like the idea of having the confidence of knowing that someone is there, someone will always be there to make things right. It's not just that they're going to be there for the one year, whatever it is from project ideation to design, to execution, to commissioning, but they'll be there in perpetuity. If something, you know, suppose uh, it's a, a, a hospitality venue and they're doing a Super Bowl event, that someone on that team, the integrator team is going to get up from their couch and remote in and make sure that that hospitality venue, their Super Bowl event goes off without a hitch. With a more traditional CapEx project-based approach, that may or may not be the case. It may be that the client then needs to figure out and kind of MacGyver it and figure out what am I gonna do now because I don't have a continuing relationship with the integrator that hooked me up. Whereas if you do have, you know, whether it's the remote in capability, the break fix capability, someone is going to be able, if you have more of an operating or more of a continuing relationship to get in there and make it right. So I think, you know, moving away from the capital expenditure, moving into more of an operational expenditure, recurring revenue, a continuing relationship, it would give me, at least if I was an end user, a whole lot more confidence knowing that I have a relationship with my partner that extends beyond one project, one contract, one moment in time, so to speak. I think it's also true, and let me know, you know if you disagree, Wes, that internally within organizations, when you think about budgeting, sometimes different pots are a little bit more flush with cash than others. So example, sure. Suppose there's an IT department in a school versus like an AV department in a school. If an IT department needs something or wants something, they might get it a little bit more readily than the AV department would. So if you think about that as an analogy, you know, if you think about capital expenditures, it may be that in, in tough economic times, there's a cap or a limit on capital expenditures. They may not be as forthcoming in making those big one time purchases. But those restrictions may or may not apply to more operational expenditures. 
Sure. So I think sometimes if an organization wants an, to invest in technology, wants to invest in an integrated system, wants to invest in their, their capabilities to deliver outstanding experiences to their, their uh, employees and their clients, they might want to make it an operational expenditure because it simply is easier to get to yes. And sometimes I think that's a factor. Find a way to make it easier to get to yes. Yes, Dan, I, I couldn't agree more. And I actually have some personal experience with that. And uh, back in the day when I first started uh, selling both uh, internet connectivity services and uh, ran a data center and servers, once we moved into uh, kind of more of a subscription model on, on some of those things, I loved it. Uh, because sometimes it it made it easier for people that had uh, certain departmental budgets uh, to pull the trigger on their own without having to get approval, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's I, I think it's a genius way to be able to push that sales cycle along because uh, anything that's capex um, definitely has to get a lot more people involved to make those decisions when it's a much bigger number. Um, but one, it, once it's broken down on that subscription level, those departments also have the ability to make a lot more decisions on their own. So completely agree with it, have experienced it myself in my own sales career, and it's, uh, it works. Absolutely. No question about it. Great. Hey, um, one of the things we just went through, and for those watching, you won't see it because we'll be edited out, but we had some confusion in the background on my part. Uh, we have painters in the house and uh, people moving around and, and dogs, and more and more people are obviously working remotely, right, Dan? Mm -hmm. And no typically, when I think of commercial integrators, I think of things that are done, you know, on site at larger locations. And of course, now with, you know, kind of remote work, uh, changing things, people working remotely. Are there any recurring revenue streams available for, you know, for that new model, right? For, for people that, that are working from home, is there, is, are there things happening on that front? So I wouldn't necessarily say that there are streams that are specific to that, but what I would say is that given the fact that there are teams that are so dispersed these days, technology professionals, I would say, have a harder job than they've ever had before because everyone is talking these days about meeting equity. So say I'm in the, the home office and you, West, are working from home. The idea is that when we have meetings, when we collaborate, you should have the same equitable experience as I'm having. If the CEO is working from home, she should have the same equitable experience that all of us are having, that everyone essentially should be treated equally, should have the same access to each other. Nobody should feel like an add-on to a meeting. So knowing that technology professionals have such a difficult job, because they're not just trying to outfit like a single conference room anymore, or a suite of conference rooms, they have to deal with an entire dispersed dozens of person, hundreds of person, thousands of person workforce. I think it makes it all the more essential to think about those kind of services, because there's so, so little tolerance for failure at this point. And there's especially little tolerance, as I say, for the idea that suppose I'm working from home and I can't get anyone's attention in a meeting. I'm an afterthought. People forget that I'm there. So if you have an integrator partner who's consulting with you, partnering with you on a regular basis, making sure that uptime is very good, making sure that remote team members, that their experience is just as good as any other uh, person, and, and that they have that regular cadence of interaction. Again, it's not just do, setting up the system, commissioning the system saying, oh, everything works. And now we're on to Peoria to do another project, but making sure that if, if you know, suppose I'm not having a good meeting experience, I'm having a bandwidth issue, I'm having some kind of a problem remoting in. And I'm, it, as a result, it's uh, diminishing my ability to collaborate with the team. Knowing that there's a technology professional on call, whether they remote in, whether they roll a truck, whether they, you know, have some on-site staff, that they staff up my company with, whatever it is that they can do, to facilitate making that mountain a little bit easier to climb. Because as I say, I, I can't imagine a harder job than a technology professional who formerly had to oversee maybe eight or 10 or 12 conference rooms, now having to oversee 100 endpoints, 500 endpoints with people all over different countries, different time zones, different technologies. It, I couldn't even imagine it. So having someone in your corner all the time, on demand, on call, not having to contract them on an a la carte basis, but having them there, I think is essential. So when I think about remote teams and dispersed workforce, I think about having that backstop, having that support to make a very, very difficult job, a historically difficult job, just a little bit easier and taking a little bit of pressure off the, uh, the in-house team's shoulders. Yeah, and, and one of the things that's quite common, uh, you know, for any kind of uh, work technology, right, whether it be boardroom communications or uh, desktops or other things is this idea of standardization, right? Mm -hmm. I love this, the way that you phrase it, that it's kind of this equity of experience, right? That 
you know, with all these remote workers, I can kind of imagine somebody now coming in and, and actually having that as part of the question when they're looking to see what we're trying to do with our, you know, communication strategy, right? And saying, here's yeah. how the head office works. And by the way, how many remote employees do you have? We have 30 of them. Oh, well, here's our package that we do for, you know, remotees. It's all standardized and yada, yada, yada. And now you've got this package. Here's what it costs per month per employee. I got to think that would become a huge opportunity, right? So it'll be kind of exciting to see uh, what kind of evolution happens there. I would love to see some, some kind of specific packages of that sort. And obviously, they're going to be customized depending on client needs, but at sure. least having a template or a framework from which to work, because I, I highly doubt we're ever going to go back to, you know, kind of 100% in the office aspect again. So if uh, we're going to be looking at packages or templates or things that can kind of be customized from a basic framework, that should certainly be, you know, the ground zero, that should be the starting point. And to see some integrators embracing that would be some very, very exciting. Some probably are, um, but I would love to see it myself and to kind of be able to distill the essence of their ideas and share them with the audience broadly. Yeah. And uh, I know the writer in you, there's always an opportunity for a new article, right? So <laughs> absolutely. Always, always, always on the hunt. Always on the hunt. I was in a big Twitter discussion uh, last Friday and immediately I'm like, got to write an article about this. And it was written the same day. So I'm always looking for articles. Well, I was certainly inspired by the answer to that question. So thank you very much. I'm going to do some research uh, on my own. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, channels that are actually starting to diversify their offerings as well, right? So I talked about the office equipment channel earlier. Uh, I've even seen it with uh, MSPs where they're, with, they're looking at services and stuff that typically weren't the, the base of their, you know, how they started their business, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, if in the commercial integration space, if, if you're seeing that as well, are they looking at adding things like cybersecurity or physical alarm and security or, or something? Are they, are, are they starting to add things to their portfolios as well? I'm starting to see more diversification and I, I kind of have an internal debate with myself, whether it's the technologies themselves where the lines are blurring a little bit and it's a little bit harder sometimes to tell what is what because sometimes departments are merging and people responsible for what technologies are kind of overlapping or whether it's just the idea that they want to diversify their offerings, even though it is kind of a, a diverse range of things where one is not necessarily intrinsically connected to the other. Um, but I'm certainly seeing whatever the cause a lot of diversification of the baskets, the portfolios that integrators are offering. And I'm hearing ever more from integrators that they kind of want to be a one-stop shop. They want to be a one-stop shop for audio integration, for video integration, control systems, for physical alarm and security in some cases, IT and network security, structured cabling. Um, I've even heard some integrators say, you know, we'd prefer not, if possible, to, to work through the consultant channel. We, wa we want to do the design. We want to do everything. And they, they say it's kind of like, you know, one hand to shake and one throat to choke. If it's good, you shake my hand. If it's bad, choke my throat. But I don't want anybody <laughs> else. I don't want anybody else part of it. And um, I, I it's not as though this is a brand, brand new thing, but I've been hearing it much more than ever before. Uh, we just did a, a feature on Tixadia Systems, uh, Dallas-based integrator. Uh, it ran online uh, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and it's going to be in our upcoming August issue. And Steve Burke, who's the president and CEO there, you know, literally said, we want to be your technology partner. And technology is inclusive of AV, but it's also inclusive of all the other panoply of things from structured cabling and beyond. They want to do the design. They want to do everything. So, um, you know, what the, the, the origin of this is, what the driving force is, I don't necessarily know. As I say, I kind of debate myself whether it's just the blurring of the technology or simply people seeking to diversify their own offerings. But more than ever before, I've heard people saying we want to be the technology provider, the one-stop shop. And, and Commercial Integrator kind of caters to that to some extent. It actually says on the front of the magazine, the business handbook for technology technology professionals. I think more than ever, companies are and people are thinking of themselves as technology professionals, which kind of encompasses all of the things that you talked about, West, not just, well, I'm an AV integrator. And far from what I heard when I was, you know, when I entered the industry 20 years ago, well, I'm a sound system contractor. Oh, I'm a video contractor. I don't hear that at all anymore. So the zeitgeist very much seems to be more toward inclusivity and bringing things in rather than specialization and narrowing things out. Yeah, and, and we're seeing that uh, across multiple channels, right? So one of my uh, favorite people in the world, his name is Chip Vaselli. He uh, uh, operates a business out of uh, the Chicago area. 
and started uh, basically with copiers and printers, but now has a business that spans, oh, you name it, uh, cybersecurity, uh, managed network services, uh, most recently interior uh, LED panels, uh, mm -hmm. display panels, and now also moving into EV chargers, right, that are in the parking lots of the customers that he serves. And he said that he's becoming much more like, as you kind of mentioned earlier, like a general contractor. He doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily do all the parts. Um, he works with people and has partnerships for some of those things. Uh, I got I can only imagine how complex and what the regulations are for, you know, EV electric uh, charging stations, right? But oh yeah, he has wow. pe has people that have that expertise. So uh, exactly what you said. If he says if the technology touches your business, I want to manage it for you. Right. I don't care what that looks like. So, yeah, very cool. Um, this is uh, one of those questions. I call it the impossible question, right? Because now I'm going to ask you in respect for your time and uh, keeping the interview within our limit. Um, if, if you only have one piece of advice for folks out there that are looking to get more recurring revenue in the commercial integration space, what would that be? What I would say is really do it with intentionality. I think, you know, everyone is talking these days about RMR, they're talking about the as a service model, but it can't be done in a, in a haphazard way or a perfunctory way where you feel like, well, everyone else is doing it. And, and you know, a commercial integrator is telling me I should do it. So I guess I'll try to fumble my way through for lack of a better way of saying it. It really has to be well thought out. It has to be well planned and recognize that there are a host of different paths one can take and you have to figure out what works best for you. There are some integrators, you know, I, I'm mentioning commercial integrator a lot, but uh, McCann Systems, we just did a feature on them in the June issue. And I remember talking to, to Frank McCann, others on the leadership team. They said 99% of their clients have some kind of a continuing relationship with McCann. It could be as simple as break fix. It could be as extensive as full-on staffing of rooms and of, of campuses. So they, what they're doing is figuring out a way to build it in as part of the ideation of a project, as part of the proposal of a project. It's not an add-on. It's not a throw-in. It's something that is intrinsic to the very approach they're taking. And what I would say is integrators should find a way to make service, whatever permutation it might take, a core fundamental part of every pitch, every contract, every discussion, find a way to make it part of it rather than just throw it in as the, you know, the, like a you know, car sale. They talk about the warranty in the last couple of minutes. Make it part of the conversation from the very, very start. And recognize, as I say, there are a lot of permutations. It could be as simple as a break fix agreement. It could be a remoting in thing. I, as I was talking about, you know, your Super Bowl events going on and you need someone to remote in right then and there, even if it's a Sunday night, that could be one way of doing it. It could be as expansive as something like AV as a subscription, where you move entire away from capital expenditures and you just kind of uh, work with a company like Tamco, a financing company, install all the equipment and then reap the benefits of a monthly or quarterly cadence of payments and move entirely away from the idea of hardware sales. Become the next Microsoft and instead of selling the office suite, just kind of you rent it, so to speak, mm -hmm. make it a service where people pay you for the service, but there is never a sale because there's never ownership. That's obviously a very ambitious way of doing it. And I only bring it up because I want to say there are so many different ways to approach it. But the key, I think that the essence is do it with intentionality and do not do it as kind of a, a, a perfunctory gesture towards something you're told to do. Anything perfunctory in this regard is probably not going to work. Yeah, I, I love it. So it really is about intentionality, about uh, commitment to the new path, right? So absolutely. Yeah. And we've seen that in, in many channels that I deal with as well, um, where the ones that have always succeeded and sort of taken the lion's share of the of the new opportunities are the ones that have actually invested in the opportunity. It's not just a, an experiment, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we beat the drum on it a lot. And sometimes, you know, the odd person will criticize CI saying you keep talking about service, you keep talking about recurring, recurring revenue, we get the point. And I know that, you know, some people may believe in it, some people may not. But 
uh, to go back to what we talked about, that state of the industry study that we did and talking about hardware margins that in many cases are simply not enough to sustain a, a, an overhead, or you have to find some way to kind of jury rig it to make sure that you cover your overhead. If we want to make integrators run their businesses better, help integrators to run their businesses better, we want to pound the drum on something that has the potential to really boost your revenues, really boost your sustainability, and give you a much tighter alignment with your clients, much more stickiness. That's what that's what we all want, right? Stickiness with our clients, the opportunity to leverage the relationships we've built and be the go-to partner. This, I think, is the path to leveraging those relationships, being the go-to partner, and having you know, a multi-year commitment, multi-project commitment with your clients. Great. And uh, I'm a bit of a geek, so like in Lord of the Rings, uh, one ring to rule them all, right? So make sure <laughs> that you are that, uh, that one central source for you know, people to get the things that they need to get done well. well if Dan, you're not, I, someone else will be. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I cannot thank you enough for doing the interview today. And uh, for all of our listeners and for our viewers, I cannot thank you enough for tuning into another episode. And remember, until next time, keep learning.